Good morning, and welcome to our time of worship today. We're glad that you have chosen to be with us during our virtual worship service. We ask God's blessings to be upon each and every one of you. Just a few things quickly by way of announcement. Please note that we do have meetings for the Trinity Circle and Circle for Christ tomorrow evening, also the Board of Trustees. We have our Revelation Bible study this Wednesday morning. That will be online through the church website and also our Facebook group page. This week we'll begin looking at Revelation chapter 3. We have our Ash Wednesday drive through service coming up one week from this Wednesday. There will be two different opportunities, two different time slots. One is from noon until 1, and then a second from 5 until 6 p.m., so whichever is convenient for you, we encourage you to come and be a part of that. It'll be very similar to what we did during Holy Week last year when we did the drive through communion ceremony. And we are excited that hopefully, good Lord willing, in two weeks we will be back to in-person worship and in-person Bible study. Again, we'll be reevaluating that as we go through this next week or two, just checking on the COVID numbers and so forth. But the target date right now for returning will be coming up in two weeks on February the 21st. Our flowers today have been given by Rosalie Barden and her family, and we say thank you to her this morning. Also, I'd like to let you know of a blood drive that we'll be having here at Little Rock coming up on Monday, March the 1st. The time slots and everything are still being finalized, but there will be two purposes to this. If you are eligible to give, if you are within your 56 days, you can certainly come and donate blood that day, but it is also a special blood drive for those who have had and recovered from COVID-19. They are trying to extract the antibodies from the blood plasma, and so they're going to be encouraging people who, again, who have had COVID and recovered. If you're feeling well enough to give, then certainly we would like for you to give that day as well. And this is not just a leukama blood drive. There'll probably be some others from surrounding communities coming because there have been such a shortage of blood drives over this past year. So please keep that in mind blood drive scheduled for Monday, March the 1st. Marcy? I do want to reiterate um, that our resources for our elementary children are available on our Reflect Facebook page. And then we are having Zoom meetings with our tweens and teens at seven o'clock on Sunday nights. So if our tweens and teens um, need the Zoom information and the student materials, they need to contact me so that I can get that information to them. Um, we also, in the coming weeks, will be delivering um, different packets to the elementary families um, to prepare them for the Lenten season and the different holidays uh, that are in between um, Ash Wednesday and Holy Week. So we look forward to making contact with all of you. At this time, let us prepare our hearts for worship. Join me in the responsive call to worship. The law of the Lord is perfect. Reviving the soul, the decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The, the precepts, precepts of the Lord, Lord are right, right. Rejoicing, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true, the righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey, and drippings of the honeycomb. Let the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Let us pray together. Let us begin. God of all people, we come this day as many people with many voices and passions and viewpoints. We are many and unique, yet we are all united in you. Through your word spoken today, renew in us the gift of your spirit, that we are one in the body of Christ. 
through the one baptism and the one holy table where we feast together. Transform the words we have heard so many times before and make them fresh for us today, that we may be reminded again of your abundant love and grace. Amen. Our Old Testament lesson today comes from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verses 1 through 9. Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verses 1 through 9. Hear the word of the Lord. Now this is the commandment, the statutes, and the ordinances that the Lord your God charged me to teach you, to observe in the land that you are about to cross into and occupy, so that you and your children and your children's children may fear, the Lord, may fear the Lord your God all the days of your life and keep all his decrees and his commandments that I am commanding you, so that your days may be long. Hear, therefore, O Israel, and observe them diligently, so that it may go well with you, and so that you may multiply greatly in the land flowing with milk and honey, as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, has promised you. Hear, O Lord, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and with all your might. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you are at home and when you are away, when you lie down and when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand, fix them as an emblem on your forehead, and write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be unto, unto God. God. we go to our Heavenly Father in prayer, I call your attention to a few names that have been shared with me for our prayer list this morning. We wish to lift up the names of Mickey Davis as he's recouping from COVID-19. We also want to remember Greg Creech and his family. He's been in the hospital for a number of weeks with COVID-19 and his family finally received some good news just a few days ago. I mean, still a long ways to go for Greg Creech, but please remember Greg as he begins his lengthy road to recovery. We also want to remember Miss Frances Holland's great niece. This would be May Pittman's granddaughter. I uh, was told just to mention the name Brittany. She was in a pretty significant car accident with her family yesterday. And we certainly want to remember her, her husband, and their one-year-old during this time. Are there other names, other needs close to your hearts? Ronald Bailey. Ronald Bailey. No doubt you have many unspoken requests that are close to your hearts and minds as you're viewing this service together. Please be encouraged that God sees each and every heart and God understands the depths of our needs. Would you bow with me for a time of prayer? Lord, in this world it's so busy and hectic and stressful that, well, we don't remember. It's hard for us to get the kids and grandkids where they need to be. It's hard to make it to work on time. It's hard to remember, did we pay this bill or that bill? Lord, there's so many things that run through our minds. But Lord, your word calls us to remember something that's of far greater value and significance to remember your story, to remember the history of your salvation. And not just long ago for those escaping Egypt to go to the promised land, not just those following the exile, and not even those in the early Christian community. Even today, we have a story to remember, a story that has shaped us and so made us in your image and equipped us to be what the church is called to be, especially in this generation. 
Lord, we should never tire of this story. We should do just as those words of Deuteronomy have encouraged us and to share it with our families, to make it a central part of our home life, to be evident in everything that we do and say when we're in public. Lord, your salvation has been a reality to each of us who are in Christ. And as we live, may we do so in such a way that people are evident of the change, that people will notice who you are, the significance of your salvation, and how you long to bring transformation to each and every life who will believe. God, we thank you for this season of worship this time where we can assemble as your people, even if it may be virtually, we know that you are here in our midst. We ask, Lord, that you would open our hearts and minds to be receptive to our special music, the reading of Holy Scripture, the proclamation of your word. May our focus be fully upon you during these moments together. God, we pause and we say thank you for the multitude of blessings that you have provided us with and for the great assurance that you will continue to journey with us into our tomorrows. Lord, we think of those names that have been mentioned verbally this morning, those that are represented by those who are watching this service today and in the days to come. You know our hearts. You know our hurts and frustrations and Lord, we invite you to come alongside wherever there are needs, whatever the nature of those needs might be. Help your people to be reassured that you are indeed with us through times of sadness and sorrow, through times of pain and brokenness, but not just in the difficulties of life. You long to be with us in the joys and the celebrations of the everyday. Lord, I ask that you would touch these hearts, that you would encourage these spirits, that you would meet needs as only you can for those who have been in accidents, those recouping from surgeries, those who are facing tests, those going through periods of treatment, those who are continuing this journey of COVID-19, families who are bereaved at the passing of loved ones, we are grateful that you are a God for all seasons of life and that you truly understand us even when we don't understand our circumstances. Lord, we lift up these names, these needs, and we place them confidently before your throne of grace, seeking not our will to be done, but your will to be done on earth even as it is in heaven. Lord, we thank you for your goodness, your love, your mercy unto us each and every day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We are blessed to have our special music today provided by Matt, Matt Ferguson. Matt always does a great job in singing and playing the piano. We know that God has laid something beautiful upon his heart. We heard just a, a glimpse of that a few moments ago as he was finishing up some rehearsal, and no doubt your hearts will be blessed. So may we allow God's Spirit to speak to us from the gift of Matt's music today. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. From wherever you've been Come broken hearted Let the rescue begin Come find your mercy Oh sinner come kneel Earth has no sorrow That heaven can't heal Earth has no sorrow That heaven can heal So lay down your burden your shame all who are broken lift up your face oh wonder come home you're not too far so lay down your hurt lay down your 
Come as you are There's hope for the hopeless And all who have strayed Come sit at the table Come taste the grace There's rest for the weary Rest that endures Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't cure. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't cure. So lay down your burdens, lay down your shame. And all who are broken, lift up your Lay down your heart, come as you are, come as you are, fall in his arms, come as you are. There's joy for the morning, oh sinner be still. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can heal. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can heal. We are truly blessed with a lot of giftedness and, and talents in this church. At this time, let's read responsively the litany of discipleship. Jesus, you came into the world to restore us to our rightful place as children of God. You are the light of the world. You do not walk in the darkness, but have the light of life. You are, you are the, the light, light of the world. world. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to you. You, you are, are the, the light, light of the world. world. After your resurrection, you ascended into heaven, leaving us instruction to go and make disciples. Make us a light to the world. To share the good news with all creation. Make us a light to the world. To show compassion for the poor and needy. Make us a light to the world. To be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Make us a light to the world. We celebrate your resurrection, your ascension, and your place at the right hand of God. We, we live, live in the light of Christ. of Christ. We await your return and rely upon the Holy Spirit, our helper. We, we live, live in the light of Christ. Christ. We are your church, your body on earth, a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. We, we live, live in the light of Christ. Christ. Amen. Amen. As Marcy has already mentioned, we are greatly blessed in a number of ways within our congregation. I wish to express our gratitude to Matt for our special music today. Terry being our guest musician this morning. Certainly Marcy and the leadership she provides during worship and also Don working behind the scenes with our sound and our camera. It takes people working together to be the people God wants us to be, even though we are 
not connected physically as far as being here in person, we still know it takes God's people working together to make things happen virtually. And we are truly gifted and blessed beyond measure here at Little Rock. Our sermon text for today is taken from Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20. It's a text that is very well known to the faith community. It's one that is probably a little too common when we think about all of the stories or the words of Jesus that we know like the back of our hands, so to speak. But it's also one of those that we take for granted, we ignore, we neglect. In fact, rather than what it's become known as the Great Commission, we treat it more like the Great Omission. Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. During these Sundays at the beginning of 2021, we've been looking at the focus or the theme of being refocused in our faith. The first week we were together, I talked a little bit about purpose and how we must have a purpose, something we are focused upon, something that is driving the direction we are moving in in the practice of our faith. The second week, we talked about compassion and how we should live lives that are not just concerned about the needs and hurts of others around us, but being willing to get involved, to be hands-on, to be the feet and hands of Jesus to those wherever the needs might exist. A couple of Sundays ago, we talked about praying as a community what it would be like if we would truly pour out our hearts and our souls before God and allowed God to pour out God's Spirit fresh and new within our lives. Last week, we talked about the importance of Christian witness and how all of us have a story of God's grace and how our personal evangelism need not be anything intimidating, but allowing God to use our story to tell other people what we have seen and heard and known of Christ and the implications that has had upon our lives. Well, today we're going to focus a little bit more on something that we probably all neglect as congregations, whether we're Little Rock, whether we're Free Will Baptist, no matter where we are, our focus is often upon the witness, the evangelism, get people into the church, get them saved, get them baptized, but then there's that question, now what? What are the next steps? And that's one of the facets that we're going to focus on today as we hear these words from Matthew chapter 28. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had directed them, but when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the very end of the age." May God add a blessing to this reading, hearing, understanding, and living of God's Word for our days. Where do I go from here? That's a question that's common to a lot of young believers. What's next? Where do I need to go? Where do I need to turn to try to make sense, if you will, of this newfound Christianity? That was something I wrestled with even as I was coming along. I grew up in church, being there practically every time the doors were open, whether it was for Sunday school and Sunday morning worship or youth programs or Wednesday night Bible study. There were plenty of opportunities to get church, so to speak, when I was coming along between my parents and my grandparents. But to be honest with you, I really didn't think a whole lot about my faith. I knew that it was important. It was very important to my parents and grandparents to get saved, to join the church, to be baptized. I knew that was a conversation that my daddy and I had had many times. He would come to me and say, now when you get ready, when the time is right, you'll know it if you want to sit down and talk about making a profession of faith. 
But once I made that profession of faith, I'm not sure that I really took it all that seriously. I viewed it as making the big decision, getting others off of my back, knowing that it was important to family. It was a blessing to the church to see this young man who had grown up in Reedy Branch finally come to profess Christ as Lord and Savior, walk before the congregation, and be baptized a few weeks later. But I never really thought about what it meant. The next steps. And I fear that's where we are with a lot of young Christians today. We take a lot of things for granted as the community of faith. I'll give you a good illustration of this. Just a couple of summers ago, Marcy was finishing up with the Summer Adventures program on a given Wednesday, and there was a dad who came by to pick up the children. And he asked to speak with the pastor, and I just happened to be in the education building getting some things in order for the Wednesday night Bible study. And he and I engaged in a conversation for, oh, maybe 10 or 15 minutes. It wasn't anything really heavy. He wasn't dealing with any personal problems. We just had a general good conversation about the Bible. And in that conversation, I began to explain some things that we were doing in our Wednesday night Bible study. And here I was, senior pastor, been in church my whole life, 39 years of age, and I knew what I was talking about. Old Testament versus New Testament, Old Covenant, the New Covenant that we have in Christ, the relationship that God had with Abraham to be a blessing to all the nations. Oh, I was explaining as good as I could explain, but then this gentleman paused in the conversation. He stopped me, and he said, well, Kelly, what do you mean by this? What do you mean about that? What what are you saying when you're talking about two different testaments, old versus new? And it dawned on me in that moment how foolish I had been. We make assumptions about what people know about Christianity. We assume that since we've been in the church our whole lives that we know the language, we know the terminology, we know all of the ins and outs, so to speak, and then when we come upon someone that maybe is not as seasoned in the faith, we're like, oh, come on, you must know about this. Surely you've heard about that. Definitely you've read thus and such in the Bible. How foolish I was. And I fear that's one of the grave dangers within the body of Christ today, especially when we think about this topic of being refocused as a community of faith. It's the task of what we call discipleship to help people of all ages and backgrounds and life experiences to make sense of what it means to be in Christ. Discipleship is one of the most important things that we are about or that we should be about as the community of faith. Yes, we come together to worship. Yes, we want to reach out and serve the community and meet needs. Yes, we want people getting saved. But what are we doing with people after that? How are we encouraging them in their walk of faith? How are we going into their shoes, so to speak, and remembering what it was like for us long ago to be new in our beliefs? Dietrich Bonhoeffer once said that a Christianity without discipleship is always a Christianity that is without Christ. But that's something we all wrestle with. 
helping people to take those next steps, those baby steps to understanding, to wrestling with what it means now to be in Christ, how that's going to inform and transform their lives and how that's going to help them live as a different people and become witnesses of their own going forward. Ray Altman Another great author has described a lack of discipleship in the Christian community as such. The cost of non-discipleship is the irrelevance of the church. When we leave people hanging, we do a lot of disservice to many people in the faith. People get discouraged, they give up, they throw in the towel... Or either they become content in their faith where they know just enough, so to speak, to get them into heaven when they die, but they're content not wanting to go beyond that any deeper in their commitment to Christ. But here in these words that Jesus issued to those early disciples following His resurrection, we still find echoes of these words for our lives today as a faith community. To go into all of the world and make disciples. Now the imperative of this text is not the going. It's important that we do something with our faith. We have to get up out of the pews. We have to get up off of the sofa, so to speak. We have to get active with our faith. We have to put faith into practice. But the imperative, that word of command that Jesus issued that we find in this text, when you look at the Greek wording that's used there, it's not go as though we're creating new foreign mission campaigns, go to the foreign countries, go to the mission field, carry the gospel out there. Yes, that is a part of who we are in Christ. But Jesus' real command in this passage is upon discipleship. It's as though we could translate this text, as you find yourself going out into the world here, there, and yonder, make disciples. Instruct other people in the faith. Encourage them. Draw alongside of them so that they may move from just a superficial knowledge of God to the kind of relationship that's molding and remaking so many facets of life. It's an interesting part of this text that's often skipped over because we're so eager to move into those words of commissioning. But it tells us that the disciples were obedient and they went to that location. We don't know precisely where Jesus had them to meet Him. It was somewhere in Galilee. And when they came and Jesus appeared to them, the text says that they worshipped Him, but some doubted. They worshipped Him, but some doubted. And that is an important thing that we have to remember as the people of God. Is that not everyone has the church background. Not everyone has this deep understanding of spiritual things. There are a lot of people in the world today that are skeptical when it comes to Christianity. They're trying to find something that's real and trustworthy, something they can really buy into. They don't want some crackpot religion. They don't want the kind of scandalous Christianity that makes it in the news from time to time. They want something that has substance and value and consistency and a sense of being rooted and established in something. And those kind of people come from a lot of different life experiences. And they have questions. And they have concerns. And they have doubts. And that's one of the things I love about this text is the fact that there were disciples that day who went, who acknowledged the risen Christ, who worshipped. But even in their midst, there were some who had their doubts, their hesitations. That's something I don't think we're always prepared for as Christians, are we? 
We're really good about being able to spout the right answers in the right context to the right people. We're good at explaining certain things about, well, do one, two, and three, and you'll be the ideal Christian, but then someone puzzles us with a question that we're like, wait a minute, they didn't teach me how to respond in those situations. I was visiting with a former parishioner a couple of weeks ago. His mother had called me back at Christmas and invited me to come over and spend some time with Bud. And Bud, Bud's been through a lot. Bud has been through a number of life experiences. He was a truck driver for many years. He saw a lot of things, did a lot of things while he was on the road. And in the last five or six years, he's had a lot of health issues, significant battles with cancer, he had a stroke during the cancer. He's been dealing with shingles. So many things that have really been working against Bud in the physical understanding of life. And I remember years ago visiting with Bud, and I was one of the few people that Bud would even really allow to come around because of how the health issues had taken such a toll on him. He was just very self-aware, self-conscious of things that were going on. And to be honest, it was a little bit embarrassing for other people to go along. And so I would go by from time to time, and I would visit with Bud, and Bud would raise some powerful questions about God. Why is God doing this to me, preacher? If God is so good and loving and merciful, then why is my grandson battling leukemia? Why did someone as good as my daddy pass away a few years ago? Why am I in this situation putting my mama through additional stress? And he and I went back and forth during those visits many, many times. As I went by to see Bud two weeks ago, we picked up as if we hadn't even missed a beat. He and I talked about life. We talked about what was going on in the world. We talked about my little girl. We talked about so many positive, just good, everyday things in life. But then there was that moment in the conversation when everything shifted. Where it went beyond the warm fuzzies and the catching up. It went back to those hard questions of doubt and fear. And misunderstanding. And I remember looking at Bud and I said, Bud, it's okay to have these feelings. It's okay to have these questions because just because we are a people of faith, we're also a people who are human beings. And God is bigger than our questions. And to have doubts is not an absence of fear. If anything, it's just trying to make sense of the faith that we do possess. In those moments together, I gave Bud permission to wrestle, to question, and to doubt. And that's what we find Jesus doing in this text we know as the Great Commission. Jesus came to the disciples, some worshipped, some doubted, but He didn't rebuke the doubt. He didn't say, okay, let me give you a dissertation on what faith is all about. Instead, He moved beyond that and still commissioned those same individuals to go out and create other disciples. And that's what God does with our lives. We don't have to have it together. We don't have to have everything perfect and put in order in our lives before God can use us. And the same is true for those who come into the body of Christ. They don't have to have their act together. They don't have to have life ironed out nice and neat before they can become a people of the faith community. And we as sisters and brothers in the faith must be prepared spiritually to draw alongside such individuals who come with their questions without making blanket statements and assumptions based on our own faith. Jesus says, go and make disciples. What do we mean by that? 
It means one, being patient with people, listening to them, hearing what their life experiences are, how they have come or, or why they're considering coming to faith, building a trustworthy relationship with other people that indicates we're not simply trying to get a yes or no response out of them, but that we truly are concerned about them physically, spiritually, mentally, emotionally. We have to be patient in order to make disciples. We have to give them a space that is comforting where they can wrestle with the issues of life and say, okay, the Bible says this, but the world says this. How do I make sense of these two different things? How do I make connections between what I say I believe and what I do in reality? being patient in the process, giving them space to wrestle with their doubts and their fears. But it's also a matter of being encouragers. Just as a coach is there to help his or her team play the very best they can, and if they have a great game, giving them words of affirmation, and if they don't play so well, still giving them some affirmation and challenging them to be a little bit better next time. That's a part of our calling as discipleship, is to be like coaches. Encouraging people when they're making sense of their faith, when they're doing something that's really well and rewarding for them, but even when they slip up and make mistakes, still being there and being present to help them move forward. Jesus says a couple of things about discipleship. One, baptize them. And we're talking about more here than just dunking them underwater and adding them to the church roster. We're talking about make them a part of something. And when we disciple people, we're inviting them in to be a part of who we are as God's people. It's not a country club. It's not about it being exclusive in our faith. It's about accepting people and making them a part of the family and not just loosely connected. But it's also a matter of teaching. Teaching in word and also in example. What it means to get it right. That was something one of my professors at Mount Olive years ago said, we learn so much about what it means to be Christian when we watch other people who do it and do it well. Our life example becomes a testimony to other people who are young in their faith, who are trying to grow. It says, my home pastor said many years ago, we are still a people who are growing even if we've been in Christ for many years. And he used the illustration of reaching up to God, striving, pressing on, as Paul speaks of, toward God, while at the same time reaching a hand back to help up a sister or brother and bring them along on this journey. Discipleship is something that must be a part of who we are. It's something that we must rediscover, especially in the times in which we are living. We can't simply throw people to the wolves. We can't leave people out to dry when they're trying to learn the faith and do this thing called Christianity. We must be their helpmates. We must be their support structure. Discipleship takes place in so many different forms. One thing that I can say when I look at our churches mission statement and that second part last week I shared the the first part of that but when we look at what it means for us as Little Rock it means that we're creating a community of people who resemble Christ and do the work of Christ in the world 
It's not just our first part, our mission statement that says, reach as many people for Christ. Yes, that's essential, but then we must be equipped for those next steps. And that's why we do things like our Wednesday Bible study, even virtually. That's why Marcy meets with the tweens and teens on Sunday night for Bible study. That's why just about every Sunday morning for the past year, Jerry has come in to record a Sunday school lesson and done a wonderful job with it. That's why Kathy continues to work with our young people through Zoom. That's why we have children's church and junior church when we are able to be here in person. We do this not just to come together, not just to have another event, not just to feel good about ourselves and what we've been able to do. We do this to equip other people to share this journey, to do faith together. I close with this question from one of my professors at Campbell Divinity School. Dr. Bruce Powers was often known for this simple question. What are we trying to do to people? What we're about as the church is not indoctrination, It's not about just giving people the right answers, giving people a simple formula for day-to-day living. But it's about helping people. It's about not just telling people, it's about showing people. It's about helping people to get up when they stumble. It's about being transparent ourselves, even if we've been Christian for many, many years. It's being willing to open up to our own personal struggles and vulnerability. Because it's in those moments that we help make disciples and not simply converts. Thanks be unto God. Amen and amen. During this time of invitation, as Terry's playing, I'd like for us to be open to the movement of God's Spirit. If you've never accepted Christ and invited Him in to be your personal Lord and Savior, you can do so right where you are, right here and now, by confessing that one, you're a sinner, two, that you believe that Christ died on the cross for your sins, and three, that you long to follow Him for the rest of your days. Maybe you would like to recommit your life to following Christ. Maybe you started out really good on this path of discipleship, being discipled, helping make disciples of others, but just because life is so busy, you've slipped up. Perhaps there are needs, burdens that are pressing in on you or your family, or even thanksgivings you would like to lift up to your Heavenly Father. No matter the need, no matter the condition of your heart, God is ready, willing, and able to listen. Will you listen to the Spirit as we meditate together?
My brothers and sisters, it's been good to be with you today during this season of worship. May the Lord bless you and keep you in going forward and being his hands and feet in the days to come. Would you bow to receive our benediction and also the blessing of this week's offering? Dear God, even as we are being discipled in our own faith, you've encouraged us to go out and to make disciples of others. It means that even as we're learning, we still pull alongside of other people. We remember what it was like to be young in our faith, and we encourage them through the ups and downs, the twists and turns of life. Because, Lord, faith is not just something we confess. It's not just something we obtain. Lord, faith is something we do. It's something we live. And that's from the beginning of life until its very conclusion. Enable us, Lord, as we're being drawn closer to you to reach back and to try to help other people along so that they also may be drawn closer and closer to you as well. God, we thank you for this time that we've been able to be together this morning. Father, we ask that you would bless these tithes and offerings that have been received or will be received, that you might multiply them for the ongoing work of your kingdom here upon earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go in the peace of Christ.